With massive layoffs in nearly every sector, weakness in manufacturing, car sales and housing, and the biggest one-month decline in the trade deficit since the financial crisis, the economic picture is not looking good, which might explain why so many billionaires are loading up on gold, including hedge fund manager John Paulson and real estate mogul Sam Zell. Bottom line, now is the time to own gold, which is why the experts at Stansbury Research just stepped forward with a major gold prediction, arguing gold could soar as high as $3,000 by the end of the year, possibly even higher. You can find out why and get instant access to their number one gold investment today. It's not bullion, an ETF, or a mining stock. But in the past, this gold strategy could have made you nearly 50x your money. Considering how quickly the price of gold has been moving in recent weeks, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the gains these experts believe are in store for this gold stock. To get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to goldmaniareport.com. Again, that's goldmaniareport.com for a free copy of his new report. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone. Welcome back to the Daniela Cambone Show. Well, when you need answers surrounding balloons in the air and, and, and spy games, I mean, who are you going to call? So I have brought on who I believe is the best person to answer the burning questions I have. Please welcome back Robert Kiyosaki, best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert, good to see you. Always a pleasure, Danielle. Always a pleasure. I love your skyline behind you. I love, I love the city. Most expensive uh, building across the street in New York City. Um, hopefully give us some good vibes. Robert, I swear, when, when, as soon as the headlines broke about the spy balloons... I said, I got to get Robert Kiyosaki on because I know he's going to have, I know he's going to have an opinion. Um, so let's just, you know, fill the folks in. If you haven't been following the balloon saga for some reason, well, Washington has accused Beijing of using surveillance and China says it was a civilian research uh, vessel that, that drifted across Alaska's uh, islands. And then, of course, we had the uh, UFO spottings and, and, and shooting downs in Canada. And Robert, you've recently tweeted, well, China floats spy balloon over the U.S. and we don't shoot it down. China buys thousands of acres of farmland next to our air bases. China sends thousands of students to our schools. China uses TikTok to hypnotize and gather data. So why aren't we fighting back? So first of all, your thoughts overall on these, about these balloons, Robert? Well, first of all, I'm Japanese-American and fourth generation. So I'm not going to tout the homeland of Japan. But during World War II, the Japanese floated 9,000 balloons over America. And there's a plaque written to that. So this is not something new. It's a way of spying. But also, I, being fourth generation, I flew for the U.S. Marine Corps in Vietnam. And this is what I flew. It's a helicopter gunship. And <clears throat> they don't need an F-22 to shoot down a balloon. <laughs> They, they they could send one of these things up. <laughs> so it's it's did an you, over. Did you ever shoot one down, Robert? Did you shoot down a balloon ever? <laughs> no, no, no. But I'm saying a, a helicopter yeah. could have done it. They didn't right. send some fighter up there to take it down. I mean, they did. Right. But they don't have so, to anyway. Right. I'm just so laughing what, at the whole thing. I mean, was it? So do you think that the fighter jet was just for the narrative, for the image of look how powerful we are? Well, Daniela, at this point, in, at my age, I have no idea what's going on anymore. It doesn't make any sense. You know, why did they open up the border and fentanyl pours across? Why, why, did they, why did Biden cut off the Keystone XL pipeline? But I think this is the biggest problem facing America today, is this thing here, is our pension crisis. Do you know, our pensions are empty. And so I've been writing about this for a while. So we got, you know, the, the Chinese spy on us all the time. They send students, as you and I have talked about, is um, my gold mine in China was taken. I took the gold mine public through the Toronto Stock Exchange. And as soon as we struck gold, the Chinese took it. But we don't do anything. Do you know, so what is, so why? They could have set one of these things up and shot down the balloon. But we do, what are we doing? Well, well this is, and this is, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting you to have the answers. I mean, no one really has the answers. But the question is, we know that from 2000, from the year 2000, the number of unidentified 
objects in the U.S. airspace has been increasing. So why are there so few answers when it comes to this China spy balloon, the, the, you know, the unidentified objects that were shot down um, in Canada. I mean, at any given time, you know, I was reading an article from Scientific Research on this, there could be hundreds or thousands of floating objects overhead. So why are we only talking about this now? Is it to distract us? And if so, from what? I suspect that, but I hate to say this, you know, I have two tours in Vietnam as a U.S. Marine. I think we're going to war. That's the worst case scenario, this Ukraine-Russia thing and, you know, Biden's dealing with China and all this. There's something really that nefarious you know, that you and I will probably never know. And, you know, my friend Donald Trump, you know, we wrote two book, Donald and I wrote two books together. He was very much against China. And Biden is very much pro-China. He and his son, Hunter, plus the Ukraine, plus Russia. So I'm not political, as you know, but I don't listen to what Biden says. I listen to what he's doing. And what he's doing is disturbing. It's very, very disturbing. And anybody who's ever been to war, like what's going on in the Ukraine, I feel for those people. I mean, the Ukraine mm -hmm. is the most corrupt country in Europe. So I don't know what's going on there either, but I feel for the civilians, you know, who are getting pounded there. My concern is, Daniela, that they throw around words such, oh, we could have a limited nuclear war. Oh, give me a break. Do you know, in 1962, I saw an atomic bomb go off because I, I grew up in Hawaii and mm. they exploded a bomb on Christmas Island in 1962. Atomic bombs are not funny. You know what I mean? They're, they're destructive. So anyway, it's, ter it's a frightening time, Daniela. It is. And, and, you know, when you say you, you're, you're concerned that we're going to go to war, um, you know, with whom? Ag against who? I don't know. That's what I mean. And, you know, when you, I'm just, you know, I, I listen to the media like you do. You know, how come the FBI took so long to find, they still haven't found Hunter's laptop. I don't even know that. And. How come Hillary did the same thing and they take down my friend Trump? I, I really don't understand what's going on. I'm, I'm perplexed. But Danielle, the good news yeah. is this. This stuff is, this is a gold eagle, this, this silver um, buffalo, and this stuff is fake. So the good news is they stay with the gold and I stay with silver. You know, because this is international money. This is God's money. It was put here by God. <laughs> well, let's let let's talk about that. Uh, is there so much stuff I want to want to talk about with you? But let's go to another tweet of yours, Robert. You say the crash is here, and you actually quote one of our uh, research reports of the Valentine's Day massacre. So thank you for that. Um, but you say everything will crash, including gold, silver, Bitcoin. Don't panic. And I know you've said this, that you, you just buy more when there's, there's crashes. But why? And, and then you, you had another one along the same uh, line of thought. By 2025, gold at 5,000, silver at 500, Bitcoin at 500,000. Why? Because the faith in the U.S. dollar, fake money will be destroyed. Gold and silver, God's money. Bitcoin is people's money. <laughs> Take care. Uh, let's talk about a, a mic drop. So why do you feel gold will crash. Let's start there. And I ask this because gold's having, you know, we're speaking on a down day today, but it's having one of its best start in decades. There's a lot of good, renewed interest and in energy surrounding gold and silver prices. Why do you feel a crash is coming? Well, because um, I like crashes. When th that balloon back there, you know, our friend George Gammon, he inspired him to hang a balloon back there. The balloon is what happened after 2008. And rather than fix the problem, you know, Bernanke just pumped money into it. Then after COVID, they pumped even more money into it. So this economy is this huge balloon. And that's you and me hanging in that little gondola back there. And that's why they say, was it going to be a hard landing or a soft landing? Well, the balloon's coming down. And that's why I use those prices like 50000 and 5000 and all this. I want to inspire people to buy gold and silver right now. I want to get them off their butts and go down to the local dealer and the, this, uh, 
This here is an eagle. My, I bought the first one in Vietnam for 50 bucks. I still have that. It was a Krugerrand, though. And it was illegal for me in 72 to buy gold. Imagine that. Illegal. I just smuggled that damn thing in. I still have that thing. I paid 50 bucks for it. And today it's worth $2,000. All that means to me is this piece of toilet paper is coming down. So I'm doing my best, like you are in Stansbury, to do our best to get people off of fake money, which is this stuff here, toilet paper, and get into silver. I love silver. I mean, how many years I've been talking about silver? Because this is an industrial metal. It's burned with every EV, every you know solar panel, and all that. This is burned up. I was just in you know uh, Vancouver for the Van VRI Vancouver Resource. What a great what a great program that is. But this is going to be the hottest thing. This is the next, you know, I'm a real estate guy, but this is going to be hotter than real estate next few years, gold and silver. So I'm, I mean, and wait, one more thing. Everybody can afford one of these things. This is about 30 bucks. This is 2000 bucks. Everybody can afford one silver eagle. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, you know, silver's all time high was around, you know, $50. Um, and so folks, at least the silver investors, right? I, I always say I feel for the silver investors who are just waiting to at least get back to that all time high. And, you know, a lot of folks have been saying, look, I've been waiting years and years and years. Like, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for these metals to finally take off, Robert? Well, that's why my concern is it's not that silver is going up. This stuff is coming down. And that's why the Rich Dad Poor Dad, you know, 25 years now, Rich Dad Poor Dad is still number one. Imagine that. And, and I, I, I said savers are losers. So I saved my, you know, my first Kruger I was 50 bucks. I bought it in Vietnam, in Hong Kong, I mean. It's now $2,000. And this used to be $50. Today it's $30. Silver is the most suppressed, manipulated, whatever you want to call it. Precious. This, this is the hottest investment right now, silver. So I would be accumulating as much as I, I, I never sell, as you know. I just accumulate. I save silver and gold, not toilet paper. And you also like, you're one of those rare unicorns that also, you know, likes gold, likes silver, and you, you also buy Bitcoin. So I'm interested um, to get your thoughts on Charlie Munger. Um, latest position. I mean, he's never minced words when it comes to, to crypto. He calls it crypto crapo, quote. He's like, it's just ridiculous anyone would buy this stuff. And he says he's not proud of his country for allowing this crap. This was a recent talk he gave and he really warned about the harm it will do. He, he actually said that nothing has done more good than national currency. And saying that you want to replace a national currency, he says, is like saying, I'm going to replace national air. So for him, the concept of crypto is absolutely absurd. I mean, what's your take? I know for you, it's all about just finding a good investment and not almost overthinking it. But, you know, any thoughts on, on his view of things? Well, Charlie Munger's an old man like me. We're about the same age. You know, so. Uh, no, wait, I, Robert, he's like 95. Well, we're, about, we're in the same category. <laughs> okay. but, you know, as when I wrote this book here, who stole my pension? My concern here is that the uh, boomers are the biggest generation in history, and when their pensions go, it's going to suck cash out of the stock market. So Charlie would probably still say buy stocks, mm -hmm. but the reason I like crypto is not Bitcoin; it's because of blockchain, and blockchain is an accounting system. You know, it's more legitimate than the Fed or the Treasury or Wall Street. So Charlie Munger is in the Fed, Treasury, Wall Street crowd. And the younger generations, millennials and below, are in, you know, I, iPhone crowd. This is the most powerful tool I've ever seen. I still don't know how to use it because I'm an old guy. But this thing here is the most powerful tool I've ever seen in history. Mm. And there's more tools coming. But this thing here, this iPhone, I'm on the, you know, I can call anybody in the world like that. It's amazing what can be done. So the younger generation is on this thing while Charlie Munger is on, you know, the Fed, Treasury, and Wall Street. Mm. 
Okay, another topic I really want to get your take on, talking about, you know, along the lines of uh, frightening things in the world. Elon Musk issuing a warning about the perils of uh, AI development. Um, he once said that AI is far more dangerous than nuclear warheads. What's interesting, Robert, is Bill Gates also speaking about AI, complete flip side, saying it is the most important innovation at the moment. This will change our world, he said. The applications of gen uh, generative AI like uh, OpenAI and JatGPT could improve office e efficiency, drafting inv invoices, and letters. So two completely points of view on AI. Musk warning us, like, look, it's getting out of hand. This is extremely j dangerous. Bill Gates embracing it. Have you given any thought to, to artificial intelligence, Robert? Well, that's a generalized principle called ephemeralization. Ephemeralization is the ability to do more with less. And that's why I'm saying this thing here is the most powerful tool I've ever seen. So this is just a start, and AI is going to take it to the next level. So I agree with both of those guys. AI is going to replace so many people and bring so many changes. Yeah. You know, it's like look at Uber and a taxi, you know. Who would have ever dream Uber was possible? And I, I, you know, I still have a trouble calling an Uber tag. I could rather call it that. <laughs> I'm so old. But the thing is, the acceleration of technology is called ephemeralization. And that's my concern, Danielle. We haven't seen anything yet because it just accelerates. Do you know what I mean? You get one invention. It's like when the car was invented and whole new industries took off from it. But... And then, but today, you know, as I, I, get in, I get in trouble all the time, too, I said, buy tuna fish. And yeah. the reason I say buy tuna fish is because tuna is a derivative of diesel, and I own oil wells. So I know what's happening in the oil industry. So I look at oil, I look at diesel, I look at tuna. <laughs> well, you know, because of that last interview, we couldn't find tuna on the shelves anymore. You just, you know, you caused everyone <laughs> to run out and buy tuna. Um, and speaking of which... Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, inflation, getting your, your, your latest thoughts, because we're speaking the day after uh, the latest PPI came out. We saw the new CPI. Basically, inflation is not going away anytime soon, right? Like we were almost rejoicing, like, yay, the, the Fed is fighting it. Well, not so fast. It's probably going to be around for longer than we thought. It's definitely stickier. Um, your, your latest and up-to-date thoughts on this inflation fight. Well, what happened, one of the first things Biden did was he cut off the Keystone XL pipeline. And as you mm -hmm. know, I own gold mines, I also own oil wells. I own anything the Fed cannot print. <laughs> so when my oil wells, when Biden came to office, when Trump exited, I was selling oil at $30 a barrel. The moment the Keystone XL pipeline came offline, oil went from 30 to 130. Today it's about 80 or 90. But oil causes inflation. Then they added, uh, you know, COVID to the whole thing, and inflation went up. And yeah, and that the ripple effect from that, the uh, precession from all that high price oil, and they're, you know, a, a strategic reserve is gone. They're buying oil from Venezuela of all places. I mean, this guy Biden's a criminal. He's buying it from Venezuela. And so our whole economy is in trouble. He's destroying the middle class because the middle class is the guy standing there next to their SUV, pumping gasoline, making me richer because I'm now selling oil for 30, I mean 80 a, a barrel. But the price of oil keeps going up. Our economy keeps coming down. So what do you expect to happen? Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Biden, so let's talk politics for a second. I mean, the, the circus has, has, has just, is starting again. I feel like we just, we just finished an election and here we are starting it out all over again. Nikki Haley announcing, uh, she's running, obviously we know Donald Trump, your friend, um, has announced as well. Uh, your take on, um, you know, who's throwing their name into the ring here and how, how you think it will play out? I think it's going to be an interesting time. You know, my, my uh, hope is for Carrie Lake, who whose election was stolen here and for governor was stolen in Arizona. And she's a great, great person. She's a friend of mine also. Carrie's fantastic. You know, I mean, she is just fantastic. And uh, we have some great candidates. Thank God they're women. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how that, that plays out. And I guess um, 
the last thing I want to talk to you about or get some insights on, I saw you tweeting a lot about, uh, you know, the talks or how you were teaching at ASU, Arizona State University, but you were saying you were then attacked by professors. I mean, can you give us insights? What went down there? What happened? Well, this summer I, sp I was at a Barrett Honors Program College yeah. teaching yeah. the honor students. And I brought all my team in to teach what real entrepreneurship and real investing is. Brought my oil guy in, brought my cattle guy in. And the students just went wild. And then so ASU then says, well, we'll book you for Gamut, which is their big you know, theater. And uh, we got attacked by the professors. So 37 professors attacked me saying, all I am is a Xerox salesman. <laughs> so Carrie Lake, bless her heart, when she heard about it, she fired her media, her media team back at them and called those 30 guys, 37 <laughs> teachers Marxists. <laughs> You're going to so have water, Robert. On. I mean, mm -hmm. the war is on inside well, this country. Um, what... Yeah, what what I know you speak so much about education and how you know most of the teachers and professors you know part of the system shouldn't be part of the system. But I, and I watched the talk that you posted, and I actually like so your friend Dennis Prager when he said um, who you who you say in the talk had a great influence on your life said bad moods are like bad breath. Don't inflict it on other people. I love that. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about how even when you were wealthy at times, you, you weren't happy and how you discovered how to be happy and you kind of start every day with a commitment to yourself to, to be in a good mood, to, to be happy. And I just thought if you could share a little bit more about that lesson and what you do on a daily basis. Well, Dennis, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, extremely ambitious. And I my you know, like many people who say, well, if I have this, then I'll be happy. If I'm a millionaire, then I'll be happy. But you get there, you're not happy. So Dennis Prager helped me because he, he speaks from the book of Deuteronomy, which says, uh, God commands you to be happy. And so my kind of my mantra every morning I get up is I say to myself, I have a moral responsibility to be happy, regardless of what's going on inside of me around me or to me. Mm. So Dennis Prager really helped me when I'm being attacked by the 37 professors at Arizona State University. And all, of, all Dennis and my doctor and I were teaching was health, wealth, and happiness. And so it was Dennis keeping me happy. And it's very simple. He says the best way to be happy is make somebody else happy. So today, and this is one of the lessons I learned from Donald Trump, was when he and I were working together, writing our books together, he often went in the back of a restaurant to say hello to the staff. I mean, that man, you know, this is before he became president, obviously, but he did his best to acknowledge, you know, people. And one day I was on stage with, I was on stage with him at uh, Javits Center in New York. We had thousands of people, and I use the term little people. And in front of everybody, Trump walked up on stage and stopped me. He says, you don't call anybody little people. And that's the kind of man he is. He is a great human being. He says too much at times. But anyway, um, you know, a, a person's actions speak louder than their words. But when he, he reprimands me and corrects me on stage for calling people little people like Leona Helmsley did, that's a great human being. And his two sons, Don Jr. Wow. and Eric, and I are good friends. They're and it takes guts to, <laughs> it takes, I would think it takes guts to reprimand Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, he, I mean, he stepped right up, Daniela. He stepped right up, don't ever say that. And so I watched his actions, <clears throat> we're upstate New York, and coming by his little restaurant, and he walked in back to say hello to the staff. You know, most of them probably illegals, but he still went back to say hello because he, he was on The Apprentice at the time. Right. He was, he's famous. He's a good man. He's, his two boys are famous and good kids, as compared to Hunter, who was a character of <laughs> epic proportions. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm assuming you, you would want to see him as president again. 
Yes. I mean, I'm afraid he's, you know, he said he's, he's hated. I don't know why. I, I watch his actions, not his words. But he, he's done a great job for this country. But he got taken down, as you know, by socialist media out of Silicon Valley. So this country's at war between socialism and this book here, communism. This book is written in 1848. It's only 50 pages long. But it has influenced more people than any, you know, any other book in history. And it's also murdered the most people. I think 100 million people, according to the Wall Street Journal, have been murdered because of this book here. And I, when I was at <clears throat> Gamage at Arizona State University speaking, I said, every teacher should read this book. They should read this book. It's only 50 pages, written in 1848. So there's a lot going on, and uh, we just stay back again. Is that you know why I love what you guys and Stansbury do is we prevent we present the facts as best we can. And right now, this this was fifty dollars in 1972. It's now two thousand. That means this thing here is going down. This is trash. I guess just to wrap, Robert. I mean. You know, you've said, you know, we know you fought in Vietnam. You've obviously faced uh, great, great challenges in your life. Um, but looking at this moment in time now, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, you know, but would you say this is probably one of the most frightening times you're going through? <clears throat> it's, it's epic. You know, it's epic means it's so much going on. My company study, we st we're studying homelessness right now. Mm. And the, the next video we're studying, <clears throat> this we studied this morning is about 20 of us get together, we watch a video, we watched a video on Venezuela, the richest country, one of the richest countries in the world is the poorest country. And then the next, next video we're studying is homelessness in California, another rich, rich country. But it's also going homeless. So it's something going on, Daniela, which I have not figured out yet. How can two rich countries, Venezuela, <clears throat> America, and the richest state, you know, California or New York, why why is the homelessness going up? It, it disturbs me. I'm, uh, I don't like it. And um, I just don't know what's going on, Danielle. Do you, have you found any answers yet? Not really. You know, I wish I could. And everybody's come up with an answer. It hasn't worked. You know, they, it, and now it would cost sixty thousand dollars to home a home, put a home for a homeless person. You know, sixty thousand dollars you can yeah. rent a place. So it's, it's strange. It's strange. It's epic times. We'll look back upon this. Go, what the hell were we doing? <laughs> I, my, my complaint always is, is, why don't they teach money at school? Why right. don't they do that? Exactly. Exactly. That point. is. And, and, I, and I thank you, Robert, for teaching me that lesson um, many, many years ago when I first started interviewing you. And yeah. I'll, uh, I'll tell you something one day about how you changed my outlook on life. But I'm going to save that when we're face-to-face. Uh, -face. But I want to thank you, as always, for coming on. I, I knew I'd love talking about the balloons with you. <laughs> you got to have some fun with it, right? That's right. That's I mean, right. Remember... A marine helicopter pilot can shoot down a balloon. You don't need an F-22 or whatever they shot it down with. You know, and why did they wait for it to cross the whole, whole America before they shut it down over the ocean? You know, it doesn't make sense to me. Something is so goofy. Why did they open up the border? I don't know. Why did they cut off the Keystone XL pipeline? I don't know. And why don't they teach money at school? I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Kiyosaki, come on anytime you want. I love talking with you. Thank you. Yeah, keep up the great work. You and Stansbury, it's fantastic work, so thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way on the Daniela Camboni Show. And don't forget to sign up at DanielaCamboni.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.